mention and honor those whose birthdays we're going to recognize tonight. Uh, after uh, we sing happy birthday, the four and five-year-olds will gather over here by the, uh, what are those things? The partition thing there, and Miss Smoker will take them down, and then the first through sixth graders will, will head down to their uh, class after the four and five-year-olds are dismissed. All right, here are our birthdays for the last week of July and the first week of August. Diane Detmer, Dave Wyland. Caroline Antwin, Sharon Phillips, Sam Robinson, <laughs> you guys are enthusiastic, I can tell, Amy Frost, David Martindale, Ernestine Waterholder, and on July 31st, Bethany Gerhardt, Anna Maria Hansen, Stephen Scott, and Daniel Walton, and now for the first week of August, Dylan Caldwell, William Foltz, <laughs> excuse me, Deborah Lichtenfeld, Fitz Preston, Larry Babb, Jan Chapman, Barbara Cross, Gabriel Lewis, Christian Troutner, <laughs> Andy Sen, and Irene Seaman. Anybody, uh, any of those here tonight? Let's stand and sing happy birthday to them. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Come on, let's give a hand, everybody. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right, the four and the five-year-olds, you can be dismissed now. Miss Smoker is right over there. So if you'd head that way. Okay, first through sixth graders, you are dismissed to go. Please clean up your tables as you leave. Thank you. See you next time, everyone. is now on. There we go.
<laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started with our missions moment. Instead of a video today, uh, our missionary is actually here in person. He's going to speak with us briefly about his work. Uh, this missionary is a new missionary, so you may not be familiar with him. He's uh, new to this year. Uh, he is my uh, friend and colleague. Uh, we've studied together for the last four years at Greenville Seminary. It's been a pleasure getting to know him. I'm very excited for what he's going to be doing in the years to come. Let me introduce to you my friend Mark Guo. Oh, it's my great delight to share with you the mission work in Taiwan. And I want to thank you so much for your support and your prayers. And if we can, make, if we can bear any fruit in Taiwan, that fruit is also yours because you are the ones that pray for us, support us, and also encourage us. I'm married with my wife, Jan, and we have five children, Elena, Anna, Owen, Francis, and Esther. And the picture was taken uh, in the doctor's office for the newborn checkup very recently. We came to uh, the U.S. from Taiwan in year 2018 just for me to study at Greenville Seminary with the intention for us to return to Taiwan for church planting after we, we are done with the study. So by God's grace, I graduated from Greenville Seminary uh, in two, uh, two months ago in May of 2022. And then in July, I just completed my ordination exam in Calvary Presbytery. And then the Presbytery has called me to be a pastor of evangelism and church planting in Taiwan. Hey, so why mission to Taiwan? Before I give you five reasons why mission to Taiwan, here are some facts about Taiwan. So Taiwan uh, is about the same size as Maryland, roughly 14,000 square miles. And two thirds of Taiwan is covered by mountains, but Taiwan has 23 million people. So as you can imagine, it's pretty packed, although it's organized. And there's only 3.3% of evangelical Christians and 60.8% of Taiwanese people, they believe in ethnic religions, while 27.3% of Taiwanese people, they believe in Buddhism. But I would say most people in Taiwan, they are believing in an inconsistent mixture of materialism and some kind of paganism, meaning that many people would tell you um, that they, they don't believe in any kind of religion. They like to pretend to be intellectually neutral while they still worship um, some kind of idols, believing that uh, they would bring them some good fortune. So now, I want to give you five reasons why we choose to return to Taiwan for church planting. First of all, I believe I... I, would, I believe I would be more useful to serve in my own country. I believe in God's providence, which I believe you also believe, and that is God's most holy, powerful, and wise in governing and preserving all his creatures and all their actions. So by God's providence, I was born and raised up and lived most of my Christian life in Taiwan. So I already know the culture and language there, and in fact, I can start preaching the gospel as soon as we land in Taiwan without having to spend years learning a new language and culture. Therefore, it seems that with all the training I have received here, I would be more useful in Taiwan than anywhere else. The second reason why mission to Taiwan is because the harvest is great, but laborers are few. As I said, Taiwan has 23 million people, but there's only 3.3% of evangelical Christians. And idol worship is very dominating in Taiwan. So, so is materialism. Hostility against the God, the creator, is getting more and more blatant, which is manifest in a horrifyingly high abortion rate in Taiwan. And also Taiwan being the very first country in Asia that legalized the same-sex marriage three years ago. And sadly, Many churches in Taiwan are gradually drifting away to pragmatism and even prosperity gospel. Therefore, I believe Taiwan needs more pastors who will preach the gospel and teach the whole counsel of God with clarity and boldness, and also plant churches committed to the ordinary means of grace. And I desire to be one of such pastors. A third reason why mission to Taiwan is because 
The churches in Taiwan need to be ready for possible persecution. As you might know, China has always been threatening to invade Taiwan. So if in God's most holy and wise providence, China really invades Taiwan and the start to persecute the churches in Taiwan, then a solid ministry of the means of grace would be vital to preserve the churches there through persecution. A fourth reason why mission to Taiwan is because Taiwan is strategically important for the mission work in China. Taiwan is geographically close to China, only about 100 miles away. And most Taiwanese people, including myself and my family, we can speak the same Mandarin language without difficulty. And Taiwan still enjoys perfect religious freedom and economic stability. Therefore, if the churches in Taiwan, especially reformed churches in Taiwan, can prosper by God's grace, then that will directly benefit the churches in China as well. A fifth reason why mission to Taiwan is because there are very few reformed churches in Taiwan, and most of them are small. Therefore, I believe Taiwan needs more church plants, but not just any kind of church plants, but church plants that are committed to the reform doctrine and practice. So just briefly about our future plan, Lord willing, we plan to return to Taiwan sometime between the end of this year and um, next summer when we finish fundraising. And when we return to Taiwan, we will serve in the northeast coast of Taiwan. It is a county called Ilan County, as you can see um, in, this, in this picture, um, the, the, the place uh, highlighted in red, and there are about 460,000 people living in that county. And I will be working with another PCM missionary. He started a church plant three years ago, so when we return, we will work together to grow this church plant, and then, Lord willing, we want to plant other churches. And the goal is to multiply church plants and also to lay a strong foundation for the Reformed churches in Taiwan. How can you pray for us? I want to share with you three things that you can pray for us about specifically. First of all, pray for God's protection for Taiwan, especially God's protection for the churches in Taiwan. Over the past decades, China has always been threatening to invade Taiwan while being more and more outspoken in recent years. They, they have been sending their war plans to enter into our air defense zone in order to cause fear and chaos among Taiwanese people. They have also been holding military drills around the island Taiwan, which can turn into real attacks anytime. So please pray for us that the Lord would restrain the evil of the Chinese government and that the Lord and the church in Taiwan would be ready for any possible persecution and that we would not fear and our ministry would not be hindered in any way. And the gospel will continue to advance and prosper regardless of any political situation. Jesus is the king at all times, at all places. And second, please pray for true conversion in Taiwan. As I mentioned, idol worship and materialism are dominating in Taiwan. But the gospel is hardly preached and heard with clarity in most churches. So pray for us that we would evangelize unbelievers by faithful preaching and presentation of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit would bless our labor with many converts. And third, pray for the health, healthy growth of the Reformed churches in Taiwan through the ordinary means of grace. So Reformed churches in Taiwan are few, and most of them are small. And there are also very few men, very few Christian men mature enough to be church officers because of feminism and also a lack of discipleship. So pray for us that we would build up the Reformed churches in Taiwan through public preaching and teaching, personal shepherding, discipleship, and evangelism, and also intentional training for Christian men to be strong leaders, both at home and at the church, mature in character and sound in theology. Again, our vision is to plant not just any kind of church, but to plant churches 
that are holding fast to the Reformed theology and ruled by Presbyterian church government and committed to the ordinary means of grace, namely the word, sacraments, and prayer, which I believe is the model for church planting and church growth revealed in God's word, especially Matthew 28 and Acts 2. So may God continue to bless the mission work in Taiwan and advance his kingdom in Taiwan. And thank you very much for all your support and prayer. And if you personally are interested in supporting us, or if you are interested in receiving our newsletters, then you can see the information on our brochure, which you will see on Sunday. I believe Mr. Brennigan will put it on the hallway of your sanctuary. Thank you very much. Well, let's remember to be in prayer for Mark Guo as he continues his work of fundraising, as he prepares his family to return to his homeland of Taiwan as he preaches the gospel there. Uh, we're going to go to our prayer meeting now. I have a few updates in our intercessor. You'll find these at the centers of your table. Let's be in prayer for Mariah Wint, who is currently suffering from long COVID, as well as David Berman, whose chemo treatments were stopped early uh, due to low uh, LGM levels. Some of you probably know what that means. I am not sure. Uh, Kai Zimmerman is awaiting uh, more diagnostics. Uh, he's had some favorable tests, uh, but there are more appointments to come. Let's remember to pray for Kai. And then finally, in the friends and family section, uh, Becky Goodwin, the daughter-in-law of Linda Kirk, has extensive cancer surgery, had surgery on uh, July 11th. Uh, she is at home recovering. Let's continue to pray for her, as well as Tracy Goodwin, uh, who is suffering under a heavy hand of spiritual warfare. Uh, besides these, let us pray for Mark Guo. I'll open us in prayer. There'll be a few others who pray, and then we'll have our lesson this evening from Jeremy Weaver. Our great God and Heavenly Father, uh, you have made all things, and you have made us, and we know that you govern your creation. You have not left us on our own, uh, but by your sovereign and powerful hand, you are upholding all things and governing all things for your purposes, for your glory, and even for the good of your people. Lord, we know that there are many uh, spiritual uh, ailments among your people, people suffering from spiritual depression, people who feel that you have turned your face against them, Lord, people who are your people and yet they lack assurance. I pray that you would encourage your people, Lord, uh, would you cause your face to shine upon them? Would you uh, uplift them by your word and by your spirit? Lord, I want to pray also for the physical needs of your people. Uh, there are many here before us suffering from cancer and from other sicknesses. Lord, I want to pray for Kai as he is uh, recovering and as he waits news on this diagnosis and the tests he's had. Lord, we pray that you'd give him favorable news that you would uh, encourage him and strengthen him and give him patience as he waits for answers, Lord, and that you use this difficult providence in his life uh, to set his eyes more straightly to heaven, more uh, fixedly on Christ, that he would know that Jesus is his good shepherd and that he carries him. Lord, I want to pray also for uh, this daughter-in-law of Linda Kirk, uh, who had extensive cancer surgery. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help her to recover well and give her uh, good remission. Lord, I want to pray for David Berman's uh, chemo treatment. Uh, and as it's been stopped now, Lord, for this uh, reason here before us, Lord, we pray uh, that you would allow that to resume if necessary, that you would uh, bring him to a full recovery as well. Lord, there are many other needs of your people here before us. Uh, prayers written for uh, for Mariah Wint, Lord, I pray uh, for this long COVID. I know she's not the only one suffering from it. Uh, I pray that you would uh, reduce those symptoms, that you would give her a uh, full recovery, uh, that the, the fatigue and the other issues that she is, is, is experiencing uh, would be uh, brought to an end. Uh, but Lord, even, even through all this, we often pray for symptoms to end and for recovery and for cures. But Lord, uh, we know your will is perfect and good and uh, more than all this, we pray that you would accomplish your purposes and all the suffering of your people. Uh, would you cause it to work in their lives uh, powerfully towards their sanctification as they undergo these trials? Uh, would you help them to rely more and more on Christ and look more and more to the day in which they'll be perfectly glorified in heaven? 
Lord, we pray now for my friend Mark Guo as he continues his labors here in raising support as he looks to the future and returning to Taiwan. I pray that you would be preparing uh, the harvest. We know the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few, Lord. And I thank you for the gifts you've given to Mark. And uh, we thank you for his family. And we thank you for the successful completion of his studies here. And we are eager uh, with much excitement and anticipation to see how you will use him in Taiwan. Uh, I pray that as, as missionaries have already uh, sown your word, uh, that you would reap a, a great harvest for your own glory. Uh, work in the hearts of your people there, Lord. Uh, call sinners uh, to salvation. Would you convince them by your word as it's preached, as it's taught, uh, that Jesus is the Christ and that he is a great Savior for them. Lord, I pray these things in his name. Amen. Almighty and creator God, we're in awe <clears throat> to be called your children. And you encourage us to call you Father. What a privilege <clears throat> to have such a heavenly Father. And <clears throat> you uh, allow us to call one another brother and sister in the family of God. We realize that though we're in your family, this world affects all of us similarly, but the difference is we have a God to go to. And tonight, <clears throat> we think of those in this, this family at Second Press. What a privilege it is to gather for dinner once a week and to see each other and realize that uh, though we don't know each other all that well, Yet there's a love and a bond that's unmatched. But tonight, Lord, I pray for the family of, of, of this church, the families that suffer in, in many ways, <clears throat> some with emotional issues, depression, fear, and spiritual challenges. Um, they're among us struggling marriages and children who are in rebellion. Among us are people seeking jobs or having financial or business setbacks. Among us are those who are grieving the loss of family members or close friends. Among us are those who have chronic pain and are ill. <clears throat> Perhaps, Lord, even some that are in harm's way or in danger because of situations in their lives. Probably every one of us here, Lord, would say that life isn't perfect, but we have a perfect Savior. We have a perfect friend in you. And so we reach out and we pray for one another. Then there are, Lord, members of our family that we don't get to see because they're shut in. Think of Edna Heath and Margaret Hook. Um, at this point of life, it's hard to imagine not being able to go out. So I pray that you would comfort these ladies and give them hope in their future as well as their present. But on the positive side, Lord, there are those who are anticipating uh, uh, upcoming marriages. Uh, we thank you for that. Uh, in the next few months, there's quite a few. Judy and Luke, Marianne and John, Haley and James, Addison and Iggy. Lord, I pray that as they prepare for these wedding days that you would give them a sense of hope and assurance that uh, you've given them this direction of marriage and you're going to bless and use their marriages. And then, Lord, what a joy to see out of some of these younger marriages and younger people that they're doing what you asked to do, to be fruitful and to multiply. And uh, it's kind of opposite of, of what our world is saying. But I pray for Laura and Kaylee and Bethany and Michaela, 
Christina, who are all expecting children. Keep them healthy during these months, Lord. And may the uh, births be successful and wonderful and bring joy to not only the mothers and fathers, but all of their families. And Lord, there have been, <clears throat> over the last 30 days or so, numerous births that uh, we give you thanks for. And we pray that they would all stay healthy and grow and develop, most of all to develop in a way that brings them to you. And uh, I pray that you would uh, bless these homes. Father, our families are dependent on you. They're, we're dependent on the power and the care and the uh, sustenance of a mighty God. And we thank you that we can ask these things and we pray them tonight in your name. Amen. Our Father and our God, we continue to come before you and give you thanks. <clears throat> thanks for this time that we have set aside where we can come before you, lift up our request to you, and Father, we know that you answer our request and you answer our request uh, <clears throat> in your great wisdom. Father, what a gr great <clears throat> and exciting time it is to hear about the work uh, that uh, Mark Quo is uh, undertaking we uh, thank you for him and his desire to serve you in Taiwan. And, Father, we lift up to you uh, the church there that uh, Mark is uh, uh, planning to go to, the Riverside Reformed Presbyterian Church. We lift that up to you and pray for that. And, Father, we do pray for those things that Mark mentioned tonight. We do pray that you will protect Taiwan from uh, the uh, 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 possible invasion from China. So we lift that up to you and pray that you will keep the people there in Taiwan safe. We also pray for uh, uh, true conversions of the people there in Taiwan. And Father, we do pray for the uh, growth of the Reformed Church in Taiwan. Father, as was mentioned, only 3% of the population is evangelical Christian. So the, uh, <clears throat> the field is white. Uh, for the harvest. So, Father, we pray for Mark as he continues to uh, raise funds. Uh, we're excited to hear that he's over halfway there, and we just pray that you will be with him as he raises additional funds and is able to get to Taiwan very soon. So we thank you for that. Thank you for him, and, um, <clears throat> and do lift up to you and pray for the work that he has before him before he can go back to Taiwan. Father, we're also excited about other uh, <clears throat> churches that we are, we are involved in uh, throughout the world. Uh, tonight, Father, we lift up to you the Berlin Presbyterian Church. Pray for Johannes Mueller as he leads that work there, and uh, just pray for growth there. Father, we pray for Christ's Covenant Presbyterian Church in Honduras, and lift up to you Aaron Halbert. Uh, pray for him and lift him up uh, to you tonight. We pray for the church in uh, Albania, the Dures Presbyterian Church, a Reformed Church, and uh, pray for the uh, for Bertie Kona as he leads that work. And Father, we also pray for right here locally in Greenville, the uh, Emmanuel Upstate Church, and pray for William Castro uh, as he leads that work. Father, we uh, also pray for the First Asian Indian Presbyterian Church in um, Northern Virginia. We lift up to you and um, pray for Jagar Shinavan. Uh, lift him up to you. And Father, we're um, <clears throat> we're happy to know that um, the uh, uh, the issue of his green card has been resolved. And uh, so, Father, that um, <clears throat> that issue is out of the way. And we just pray that. Uh, you will bless the work there in, um, in, in northern Virginia. Father, we pray for Florine Wiccan and uh, um, the church in uh, Zurich, the Presbyterian Church of Zurich. I lift that up to you, that work up to you. 
and pray for him and uh, those people there in, um, in Zurich. And Father, we pray for Andy Young and lift uh, up the Oxford Evangelical Presbyterian Church to you. We lift them up to you and pray. We continue to pray for the uh, possibility of getting the, um, <clears throat> the North Gate Hall uh, um, facility uh, in their ability to use that facility for their church. Father, we think it's uh, such a great opportunity to have that church in downtown Oxford and just lift that up and uh, as we have continued uh, to, to pray for that and uh, do pray that um, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, city council there will recognize them and um, allow them to take over that facility if it be your will. And Father, we pray for our dear friend um, Kevin Bidwell and pray for the Sheffield Presbyterian Church and that work there. Father, we're excited to know that today's the day that um, his uh, daughter was married. And uh, Father, we ask your blessings on that marriage uh, between um, uh, Ridka and uh, just lift her up to you and pray for that marriage. So Father, I pray for that and I pray for all these churches, other churches and other activities that we're involved in uh, as a church um, uh, around the world. I thank you for the uh, willingness of all the people here at Second Presbyterian Church to uh, <clears throat> donate funds to the work of Second Presbyterian Church and in particular the work of the missions work of Second Presbyterian Church. So I thank you for that and I lift these things up to you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, as we close our prayer time now, Lord, we ask that you would uh, turn your face from our sin, that you would see us through the precious blood of your Son, and that, Lord, tonight the teacher would be the Holy Spirit and not us. Lord, open your word to us now and show us great things. Lord, strengthen our trust in you. Help us to remain dependent upon you, but, Lord, help us to see what you're doing in all of creation. Lord, we thank you for this time together as our church family, and we ask for your blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good evening. Mr. Johnson, may I close this? Thank you. I do not have PowerPoint slides for you. I'm very sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry. I don't particularly care for PowerPoint. We are in Psalm 127. I think this is a wonderful church family. You're all on this side. You're not over here. But for a few new people, uh, my name's Jeremy, and I teach fifth and sixth grade Sunday school, which means I might treat you like a fifth and a sixth grader tonight. I may ask you cat kids questions and expect you to answer. And so some of you, Duncan, you're going to know the answer, perhaps. Um, but tonight we are going to look at Psalm 127. And Psalm 127, well, let me back up. Many of you may or may not watch the show. I don't necessarily recommend that you do, but you've probably seen Saturday Night Live. The producer of Saturday Night Live is Lauren Michaels, and Lauren Michaels used to say, Saturday Night Live goes on TV at 11.30 it's on Saturday night because it's 11.30 on Saturday night, not because it's finished. The more I study Psalm 127, I can assure you what we're going to go through tonight is because it's August 3rd, and it's my turn to teach. Not because I've exhausted the depths of Psalm 127. This is a big piece of scripture. All right. So let me give you a quick overview of where we're going to go. Then we'll read the text and we'll kind of get into some, some teaching. Um, the main goal tonight in looking at Psalm 127 is to, and I mean this in the nicest way possible, is to kind of rescue it. All right. If you imagine a bucket down here, like a five-gallon bucket and you pulled all the sermon audio teaching on Psalm 127 and all the good commentaries, not the bad ones, and you put it in that bucket and you scooped your hand out and said, I want to learn what Psalm 127 says, I can assure you it's going to talk about domestic stuff. And that's not bad because it talks about building, securing what you've built, and parenting. That's it, right? 
Well, there's this nefarious gentleman named O. Palmer Robertson. You've probably heard of him. He's got this good book on the Psalms, and if you are serious about reading the Psalms, I recommend you buy this book. He paints a little bit different picture, and he's going to give us what's called a covenantal, I'll say, use of this psalm. And what we find is the covenantal use of the psalm is really what gives all of the power to the domestic use of the psalm, all right? So I haven't gone and found some weird person and we're only going to have their view. What we're going to try to do is we're going to take popular teaching that you would see a lot of and all of our Baptist friends that we secretly are still friends with, they love this psalm, okay? And we love them right where they are. But what we're going to see is that there's covenant language in this psalm that is, is quite nice, actually. And the two uses are not in opposition to each other. They actually go together quite well. So if... If I achieve what I'm setting out to achieve, I want to rescue Psalm 127 from one use. And I want to show you that really there's a big use. And really that big use has its tentacles in all 66 Gospels. It's kind of a big deal. All right? So if you have your favorite app or your favorite paper version of God's Word, you can turn with me in Psalm 127. I'll read the text really quick, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Psalm 127 a song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved, wonderful word, sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb of a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Well, that is God's word as written by the psalmist. Let me go ahead and head off one uh, controversy right now about this particular piece of scripture that if you studied it, there's always this, what seems to be this argument about whether or not, in particular, this psalm or some of the psalm of ascents were written in the post-exile period, okay? I have no intention of taking up that issue tonight. But if you get into it, you're going to see that that's an issue specifically here, all right? Uh, but I don't, don't want to ignore the fact that that exists in a lot of what you might read about it, but we're just not going to deal with it. Uh, let's talk about who wrote this psalm. It's pretty important. Um, we have every reason to believe that Solomon wrote this psalm. Why? Because it says, of Solomon. Case closed, right? Well, not quite. But there's something very interesting. Look at verse 2 at the very end of it. For he gives to his beloved sleep. That word beloved is actually very important because underneath all this nice English language we have, it's a word called Jedidiah. And what Jedidiah means is beloved of the Lord, which was who you and I call Solomon, his name in 2 Samuel, let's see, I believe it's 12, 25, is Jedidiah, beloved of the Lord. So this is one of these really interesting literary techniques where the author is disguising his name in the text. That's what we believe is happening. You think, well, it seems like I've heard that somewhere before. Where? The disciple that Jesus loved, a.k.a. John, who was Jewish too. So this is a technique that we see coming up from time to time, and I think it gives us really good indication that this is from Solomon. The Solomon that we know as David's son who built the temple, who wrote most of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and so on and so on. And the, another reason I want to point that out is because if we, if we have time at the end, when we look at some application of this text, it really matters that he wrote this psalm. It's kind of a big deal. All right. Let's jump in. Two uses, all right? First use, covenant. Think that. Second use, domestic. But again, like I said, 99.9% .9 of the teaching on this psalm is all domestic, and that's not bad. But let's step out over into this other world for a minute and just kind of look at this. There are essentially three key words, and we're going to talk about where this psalm is. But those three key words are house, so verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house. And then right towards the end of that verse, you see, unless the Lord watches over 
city. All right, another key word. So we got house, city, and then way down there in verse 3, children. Children here is better. I know you're going to like, Jeremy, you don't know Hebrew. Why are you saying this? Because I read people who do know Hebrew. But children is actually better translated sons. But we can also include that to mean daughters because this is covenantal language. But this is actually better translated sons. So house, city, sons. Now, pause that for a moment. Where is this psalm? And this is what Mr. O. Palmer Robertson likes to really pick up on because there are some literary techniques going on here that we would be um, remiss if we just ran over those and ignored them. The first one is this. There are 15 Psalm of Ascents. So I'm not going to mention much about the Psalm of Ascents because I think every teacher before me on the Psalm of Ascents has told you about the Psalm of Ascents, and I've assumed that you've gone back and listened to every one of those. You don't need a refresher. We're just going to move on. But the interesting thing about Psalm 127 is it's in the middle of the Psalm of Ascents. That is not random, and we should not ignore it because there's a really cool thing that goes on in the Old Testament in a lot of places where you have a buildup of something. The middle is what it's pointing to, and then you have a build away from it. So think of it this way. It may start in verse 1 with point A, and it goes down to really what the person's trying to say, and then it builds back to where you started. All right, Very common literary technique. You see this also, especially you see it in Genesis a lot of the times, where it's as if the narrator's picking up out of the text for a moment. Perhaps there's a song or something else where you're given a clue as to how to interpret what you just heard and perhaps some direction on where you're going. Psalm 127 acts like that because it's in the middle of this. And, and what Mr. Robertson here is telling us is don't ignore that. That's on purpose. That structure is there on purpose. And then the Psalm of Ascents finds itself in book five which is also very useful. Book five, he would say, is the consummation of everything. But this is leading up to the temple. So what, what are we talking about when we say consummation? He's talking about, if you want to look at it in big picture, God's reign over all of creation. So the person who's ascending up to the temple probably has this in their mind. They're probably not thinking about quivers of children. All right. So automatically you can see there's big covenantal stuff going on here. There's really intense structure in these psalms. Not that we're going to ignore children. Don't go there with that. But we should pay attention to the way this is working. All right, so let's review just for a second. It's in the middle. It's looking back. It's looking forward. It's the pinnacle of the psalm of ascents, and it has impressive terms. What were those terms again? Class, I'll tell you. House, city, sons. How do we interpret house? Well, it could be a lot of stuff. And this is where the domestic use starts, and it's not wrong. The domestic use is talking about my house. It's talking about your house. We have large families at second. That's a wonderful thing. Um, that's the house that we like to think about. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build her are laboring in vain. We could also look at it like, um, it's your life, right? It's your career. It's your work. Unless the Lord builds that, you're, you're moving towards vanity, if not. But really, how do we interpret house? Mr. Robertson would say, well, you look at the previous psalm of ascents. You use the, pen, the, the psalms that have been building up to this pinnacle to then take the use of those terms because those terms are meant to match in all 15 psalms, all right? So if we start there, house based on Psalm 122, is very clearly talking about what, kids? It's talking about the temple. That's what Solomon's talking about when he says house. He's talking about the temple. Because what did God raise him up to do? Well, one of the many things is to build that temple. So automatically we're thinking house, temple, this is David's son, and now we're going back to what God told David. David was sitting in this nice, wonderful house, the ark is not with him. He said, I can't sit in this house. Paraphrasing the covenant, obviously. I want to build the Lord a temple for this ark, right? And so the prophet says, sure, go about what your heart tells you to do. And he says, whoop, nope, the Lord told me, you're not going to do it. Your son's going to do it. 
And in fact, you think you're going to build me a house, I'm going to build you a house. And within this covenant, your sons will sit on the throne forever. That's the language that's being applied here. So house is talking about the temple. Where is the temple? The next term tells us. It's the city. It's Jerusalem. Psalm 132 in the Song of a Psalm of Ascents specifically mentions Jerusalem. This is the city. So the city contains the house. All right. These two are working together. Now what about this term sons? Well, this is actually very interesting. Sons comes out of Psalm 132 as well. It says, as long as you obey my covenant, you will have sons on the throne forever. And we look at this, and while we want to use the domestic use, when we look at this a little bit farther, when he says, he shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. And this fruit is a reward, and it's a heritage. This language is a little bit bigger than just one family unit. When it says heritage, that, that inclines us to think long-term, not short-term. And so that's what's going on here. There's a covenantal use to this psalm. So if you imagine for a moment, that's hard, I know, but you're going up to the temple, all right, you're ascending the psalm of ascents, what is on your mind is probably not the domestic use of this. It's probably the promise under which you are operating to walk up. Like, why am I doing this? Ah, because he said he's going to build a house. He said he's going to have sons on the throne forever. Therefore, I will ascend. That is one of the big pieces that's going on here that, unfortunately, it gets missed quite a bit of the time. So that's... I want to give you that as the covenant use of this psalm. Now let's move over to what you and I typically think about when we think of this psalm. If you looked ahead and you thought, oh great, Psalm 127 is tonight, and you think I'm going to give you lots of rules and how-tos on parenting, you're wrong. I'm just not going to do that. But we are going to talk about some domestic issues. Uh, and then we want to marry the covenant use of the psalm and the domestic use of the psalm. All right, so let's get into this domestic piece. When I say domestic, what do I mean? Well, I mean exactly what it says here, unless the Lord builds the house. So I know we just defined that term as temple. All right, now in a domestic use, what will house mean? It means like the house of Jeremy. And I got, for those of y'all don't know, I got two little boys. That house is going to move on. Pray for those boys' wives. We hadn't met them yet. Well, maybe we have. I don't know. But Lord, please don't send them vexious women, right? Send them godly women. But that's the house that we're talking about here. Generations beyond me, posterity. So there's a current setting of that. I came from people, right? Obviously there's a current setting, but that's going to continue. And unless the Lord builds the house, those who are building it labor in vain. Now, the second one would be a very easy use because what, what, when you build, what are you doing? It's construction. And any of you in here who's built a house or you've made the enormous mistake of adding on to a house that you have, you realize construction is hard. And there are many points in that construction project where you look at and you say, what are we doing? Been there, done that. But construction is hard. And so any endeavor that you and I undertake in this life, hoping that God is going to bless it, we have to put this to the test and say, Am I building in a direction God wants me to build? Not just how, but what am I doing? So I had a chance to give a piece of this psalm to 23 interns in our firm, and their little internship ended last week, and they're wonderful little college students. And um, I don't always get invited to speak back where I work because I tell them the truth. <laughs> um, but I said, you know, let me be the first guy to, to let you know you actually can ruin your life. You can succeed in things that don't matter. That is a possibility. Why do I bring that up now? Because I don't think any of you are intern age. Maybe there's one. But most of you are not intern age. But even those of you who are retired, especially those who are retired or approaching retirement age, you can waste your retirement. What we have in this country is not biblical. You need to be laboring for the Lord. You can build the last quarter of your life in the wrong direction. That is a possibility. And what he's saying here is there's two builders. 
One's going in a direction of their own will, independent of God, yet God is building something. So if we were in fifth and sixth grade class, I would ask a question right now. What's missing? I'll tell you the answer. What's missing is a third category. You're in his direction or you're in your own direction. I don't like that any more than you do because I have to apply that same thing to my life. I'm an idea guy. Oh, let's do this. Let's do that. Here's some great ideas. Just because Jeremy came up with an idea doesn't mean it's God's will. Okay. So let's kind of move on beyond that. But you see some of the tension here of you and I can actually spin our wheels doing things on earth until it's our appointment with hospice comes. And that's an appointment you will not miss. And there's a limited time between now and then. We can spend our time wasting it. That's a hard reality, I think, for sometimes for those of us in this circle to think about because we are so reformed, we're flaming Calvinist, and we want to be biblical. We think that everything we touch, God is going to automatically bless, and that's just simply not true. We can absolutely waste our time on some things. So enough of that. Um, let's talk now about this, um, this piece here of security. Watchman stays awake in vain. I like the analogy in Nehemiah. <clears throat> Pastor Phillips talks a lot about this in his book, The Masculine Mandate. And uh, for, for those of you who have not read that book, I, I highly recommend it. In fact, it was what gave me an awareness of this church when I lived in Columbia and we were moving to Greenville, was some guy named Rick Phillips who wrote this book that I had been in a Bible study with. Uh, but he says something very interesting in there. Nehemiah had a sword and a trowel. So we were just talking about a construction project which all of you are engaged in construction projects in your life. You're building something, a career, a retirement, something, a ministry. Um, you kind of have to protect what you built, right? There were some bad dudes who didn't want Jerusalem's walls to come back up. And so he told them, you need a sword and a trowel. You have to build, you have to protect. Work and keep, build and protect. If the Lord doesn't protect what you're building, you are without protection. Same thing with me. It starts even in our own salvation. You are unprotected from God until the blood of his son covers you. Now, I know we're Calvinists that covered from before the foundation of the world, and we're not here to prove that point today. Um, but quite literally, we serve an amazing and awesome and yet powerful just God, and we are unprotected from him. And so we need his son. We need protection but even in our carrying out of our labors, not only will they not succeed, verse 1, they're unprotected unless he protects them. Now, this is where, I told you I'm not going to get into this controversy, but I at least want to stir it up a little bit. This is where you get some of the exilic stuff coming out of folks who want to talk about that particular possible aspect of this. Because the city was unprotected from Babylon. But that's not the issue. The issue is this. God let it be unprotected from Babylon because he was there to carry out his will because they broke covenants and there was no protection from Babylon. As you can imagine right now, anybody engaged in financial services like I am are getting lots of calls from people saying, when's the market going to do this or do that or what's happening? And what if the government's about to implode the economy? And you just hear, you couldn't imagine the stuff you hear. And one of my favorite things to tell people is if God's going to send judgment on this, there's no portfolio strategy for that. Now, we don't want to dismiss the fact that Jeremiah had to go buy a field, all right? But uh, when God tend, when he sends judgment on a people and you are there unprotected, there is no protection. That's just all there is to it. So let's talk about another term that shows that features here in these two aspects, building slash construction, our house, our career, our work, our endeavors, protecting all of that. This really pesky word that keeps coming up that really hurts, vain. This is not the exact same word that's in Ecclesiastes, but it's close enough so you get it. Y'all, one of the worst parts of the curse that we're under is vanity. You imagine, until Adam and Eve fell, there was no work that was vanity, right? But now we have to taste vanity, and it doesn't taste good. 
don't raise your hand, but in your mind, a show of hands, who's ever done anything in life that didn't turn out? And you look back and you think, boy, that was an enormous waste of time and money. I'll, I'll raise my hand. I've got stories. I've got stories of other people who have done it too. It's not fun. Vanity is a very, very hard result, and it's bad. And that's what he's saying is the result of not going in his direction, which we're going to talk about. We're going to be good people. We're going to have some how-to and some application here. But notice the choice is not just God's way or my way. It's God's way or vanity, meaninglessness. And that's a hard thing for us to put so much time and effort, money, um, innovation, whatever, all these words we can use to describe it into something that ultimately just doesn't turn out. That's a hard result. And, um, but one of the things I want to also mention here is the fact that these two particular verses, when the Lord is building the house and when he is securing the city, he gives what everybody in this room wants about two hours from now, sleep. Because we can run around like the old southern saying, chickens with our heads cut off, frantically trying to do our own will, or we can rest in what he is building and what he is doing, and therein lies rest. So big picture, first two verses, see the contrast. The contrast is God is building something, God is securing something, we're dependent upon him, we rest. And without even having to see it in the text, you know what's implied? Success. We aren't prosperity people here. Nobody's hearing that. But because he is building it, do y'all honestly think he's going to undertake a building project that's not going to work out? No, that's not going to happen. So you're promised some eternal meaning and success. It will pay off in eternity. Um, as time is ticking on here, let's, let's do talk about children for a minute. Um, the reason that I wanted to point out, one of the reasons I want to point out that Solomon is the author, Solomon is the author of wisdom literature. I think the covenantal use of this psalm is very much a promise and it's absolute. Because the sons of David will sit on the throne. You know how I know that? Because he's there now. The domestic use of this psalm is very much wisdom in nature, which means it's general, kind of. There's principles, but it's not a guarantee. Let's talk about that for a minute. Children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. It goes without saying, if you're going to have kids, God has to give them to you. All right, he's the maker of children. All right, so that's a very obvious interpretation here. But the, the hard reality is, is what do you want? What do I want? I want not just kids. I want godly kids. And I want my kids to do what is down here. I want them to be arrows in the hand of the warrior. And I want them to represent me well when I go to the gate. You were seen as wealthy and blessed in those times. If you had many sons and they accompanied you to business. When it means gate, that's the city, that's the government, that's commerce, that's all of that. And you're there with sons, meaning my opinion matters because they're going to follow me and they're going to be here for a long time. i got bunches of them. It's also helpful when it says arrows. It's not just, see, don't you love, this is where, <laughs> y'all, I'm telling you, you sample some of this and we, they say we need to make our kids arrows against false teaching. Well, that's true. But it's not just that, right? It's to defend a nation as well. That's also in view here because Israel needed an army because there were bad people who wanted to do away with Israel. So it wasn't just what you and I now see as fighting communist or, you know, continuing to press the pro-life cause, um, advancing the, the kingdom of Christ through preaching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, it means that. The more direct interpretation here is that it was because they needed an army. And that was sons. And they were arrows. But the, the bitter reality about children, and I'm not telling anybody in here anything that you guys don't know, why this is not a promise, is we just don't know what we're going to get. There are children 
unfortunately, that will turn their back on Christ, even from our own ranks, right? This is a good church. Y'all, every time I go out of state or somewhere else and I have to go worship at another church, I love this place even more. And I think we're doing great things with our children, but that alone's not enough. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to create life in their heart. Or otherwise, our labors, will God bless them? I believe so. I think we're being obedient. But it's not that that actually creates the godly child. And there's no guarantee that you get that, even with the right training. You think of the son who turns his back on Christ and then turns to substance abuse. Uh, I got lots of stories on that. You think of the, the daughter who runs off the rails, right? There's plenty of stories of that. Everybody in here has seen a child become disobedient. But don't lose heart because... Isaiah has this really interesting verse that the arm of the Lord is not so short that it cannot save. And I love what Derek Kidner says specifically in these particular verses as he's giving us interpretation of the verses. He says, many times children before they're a heritage are a handful. Y'all don't need to raise your hand and say amen. All right? Because I got kids and I know. Uh, But isn't that the case? But just look at David's life. Sure, we love Solomon. And this is where a catechism question might come in. Saul, no heart. David, whole heart. Solomon, half heart. Ooh, that one's tough, isn't it? That one's very tough. So just because this verse is in Psalm 127, and we love the domestic use of this psalm, doesn't mean that it's a guarantee that your kids are going to turn out like you want them to. We like to play a movie in our lives in evangelical America, that my kids are going to turn out to be godly. They're going to line the pew at church, and I'm going to have grand youngins, as we call them down here. They're all going to know the Lord, and there's just going to be this perfect picture. That just simply doesn't always come true, despite this psalm being written. And so um, we have to rely upon the Lord to turn the hearts of our children. But it doesn't mean that we fail to teach them. It doesn't mean that we fail to intercede. You know, I heard one wonderful Uh, Reformed Baptist preacher once say um, that um, his wife and his children may be lost due to sovereign election, but they will not be lost because he failed to intercede for them. May the same thing be said about us. So what we've got in this psalm, we've got now two uses. O. Palmer Robertson has shown us this is primarily about the Davidic covenant. This is big stuff. It's absolute and it's a promise. That's what's on the mind of Solomon. The terms tell us that. The placement of the psalm within the psalm of ascents give that nice evidence. This is the house of the Lord. This is the city that the house dwells in. And these are the sons of David through whom we get Christ. And from him, you have us. So this is big. The tentacles of this psalm reach all the way to Genesis chapter 1, especially Genesis chapter 3, all the way to Revelation, the very end of Revelation. That's what this psalm has in mind because this is book 5, the consummation. So I'm going to give you one more little piece here and then we'll talk about some application. When you think temple, city, sons, you think Davidic covenant because that's what I just told you to think. What should you also think? We started in the garden and we end in what, children? A city. The end about which God has won that he so designed in his mind that his son was not going to lose is sitting right here. It's a house, it's a city, and it will contain sons and daughters us but what we should see in this is the son that is talked about here because this is Davidic language there's a new Jerusalem there's a new heavens and there's a new earth and God will dwell with his people the son will be no more because we will have him that is the ascension of God's people throughout all time it's not just the steps up to the temple in Jerusalem it is that in its immediate context here but it's not only that all of that pointed to the absolute end of time and I think that's where this psalm really pushes you when you take a covenant use of this psalm now let's try to mash these two together why do I labor so hard 
Because the kingdom will not fail. Why do I labor with my children so hard? Because I want, the, I want them to be sons that are in that covenant. This covenantal use of this psalm is the rocket fuel for my domestic use of this psalm. I'm willing to labor alongside the Lord. I want to be called according to his purposes. I want to secure what he's building. Look at church history. They gave their life for this. They gave their life for it because they believed in the promises that are contained right here that the very son of God secured and he's won the kingdom. That's what will not fail. His labor is not in vain. So our labor needs to be attached to that. Does that make sense? If you only take a domestic use of this psalm, you're kind of left a bit empty at the end of it because you say, now, how do I make sure my labors are not in vain? Because his labors were not in vain. And you belong to him. And you are called according to his purpose. Now, how do we do that, though? Like, how? We're Americans. We need a how-to sermon. We need a topical sermon, right? How? Well, <laughs> I'll quote our friend and brother, Mr. Ligon Duncan, who gave a wonderful message on this psalm at First President Jackson. And he said, let's start by being the good Calvinist that we are. You have to remain dependent upon God for him to make you remain dependent upon him. Otherwise, you will seek your own way. That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? But how do you do that? It's word, it's prayer. It's the ordinary means of grace. I like what Pastor Phillips says. You can only backslide so much in a week. That's true. Don't miss church, right? How do we do that? We have to continue to be in relation with him. We have to sit at his feet. We have to sit at his teaching so that we are called according to his purpose, so that he makes us like him, so that we do the things he wants us to do because what he is building is not going to fail. So come alongside him as you build. All right, we've got about five minutes here. Let me give you two illustrations of how this works. If you want to, you can pull over to Genesis chapter 11. We don't have time to really unpack this a lot, but I just want you to see it. I'm very thankful for Dr. Morales at Greenville Seminary and Dr. Master for pointing this out one day. Um, if there were ever a picture of mankind building his own idea in opposition to God, would it not be the Tower of Babel? So let's just read just a couple of verses from that because we can't get into the whole thing. Starting at verse 4, this is Genesis eleven four. 4. Then they said, come let us build, oh, there's that word again, ourselves a city, oh, there's that word again, and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over all the face of the earth. What are they trying to do? What is it? Why would you build a tower? You build a tower because you want access. You want access to God and his power and his provision, maybe even his favor, but you need access. And they very clearly said what they were trying to do. We're trying to make a name for ourselves. So that what? We're not dispersed. Because if we're dispersed, what are we? We're unsecured. These people are doing exactly what Psalm 27 said don't do. So what did the Lord do? He frustrated it. I don't have to tell you the rest of the story. You know. But then keep going. Genesis 11, what comes right after Genesis 11 class? Genesis 12. What do we get in Genesis 12? This is wonderful. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless uh, you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, shall, in you, all the families shall be blessed. Everything they were trying to build, God turned around and gave to some Iraqi Bedouin who was an idol worshiper. He chose him from amongst all the people on the earth Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he said, I'm going to make your name great. Exactly what those people were doing. And if you want to see it this way, he's going to build a family through this person. And it's not just a city. What's he going to get? He's going to get it all. And then here's the really cool part. It's not in Genesis 12, but in the same Abrahamic covenant language in Genesis 17. This is wonderful. I will be your God. Now, what does that give us? 
if not protection and meaning and security and eternality, I don't know what does. Who else are you going to go to, right? Everything they were trying to build and they tried to do, God turned around and gave Abraham through a covenant. So our building, our working, our parenting, all should be lined up with exactly what this says. And it comes out of what he is doing. I loved the phrase. That was one of the Puritans. I can't remember which one he said it. We act because we have been acted upon. That act will last because you were acted upon. One more illustration, and then we'll be done. Solomon wrote this. Why do we point that out? All right, remember I said, children, interns, you can waste your life. Guess what? I'm going to tell you it's possible for you to mess everything up. Hope you don't. Solomon didn't follow this, did he? He messed every one of them up. He had a half heart. He married foreign women, foreign from the covenant, and his heart was taken away into idol worship. And much of what he built did not last. Do we want to talk about his sons? Do I need to say anything else? You remember what he said when Solomon was gone, what the next son said, right? You think he was bad? You hadn't seen nothing yet. May that not be said of our children. God gave us this psalm, and he let us know who wrote it so that he's an example that we don't follow in Solomon's footsteps. Now, I happen to believe this psalm was written right after the construction of the temple, not towards the end of his life. That's not in the text, but it sure does fit nicely. But may that be a warning to all of us that we really can run down the wrong road. Psalm 127 is here to pull us back from that, and it uses Solomon as an example. But the power for us to do that is not just thinking about be careful about what you build, be careful about what you secure, and be a really good daddy and mommy. No, the power is in the promise that what he constructs will last forever and that we should be aligned with what he's doing and give it everything that we can. So that's the middle of the Psalm of Ascents. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for this time. Thank you for this uh, beautiful piece of scripture. We ask that you would apply it to our hearts through your spirit and that you would be glorified through it. In Christ's name, amen. I think we're supposed to sing the doxology now. So if you'll rise, we'll sing. Don't listen to me. All right, you ready? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Good night. Thank you.